flames soon spread to other containers, many of which also contained batteries. We've seen in fire tests that sometimes they become projectiles, flaming projectiles, and they can spread a fire that way and make it even worse. Fire, main deck forward. By the time the crew gets a warning, the fire is already burning too intensely for the suppression system to put it out. The manual flight control system is in the direct path of the fire. Luckily, the autopilot system is not. It can still send electrical signals directly to the servos that operate the plane's controls. But when the pilot switches off the autopilot, the plane becomes nearly impossible to fly. I have no pitch control of the airplane. Fire quickly destroys more systems, including the captain's oxygen supply and the landing gear controls. I have no gear. But Straker believes the tragedy would have been even worse if not for the final actions of the first officer. 300 feet, any runway is available. At the last moment, in a plane he could barely control. If able, climb immediately. Climb immediately! He manages to narrowly avoid a suburb of Dubai. At the very end, there are some control movements that uh, go in, which if he hadn't made them two seconds beforehand, they would have collided with, with that residential area. He knew what was in front of him. And he also knew from the ground proximity warning system that the time was running out. Investigators have one final question. The 747's cargo area is equipped with a flame-resistant liner. It wraps the entire cargo hold in a protective shield. It should have protected the critical systems. We had to get on top of the reason of this failure to save other people's lives. To find out how fire could have burned through the plane's protective cargo liner, investigators conduct another dramatic test. We did our tests uh, with a representative load. The fire was, uh, was on the pallet was enormous. We were standing behind glass about 50 feet away from us, and I could feel the heat. What the test showed us is not just the energy, but the time factor as well. All this pent-up energy released so quickly that it could create this catastrophic event without the time needed for the pilots to get safely back down on the ground. The cargo liner failed. The flames spread quickly, eating through vital control systems. Once the single point of failure, which is the cargo liner, has disintegrated, you don't have protections for your oxygen system, you don't have protections for your flight control, you don't have protections for your environmental control, it's all, it's all gone. It all came down to a single point of failure. We never thought that a new aircraft could have such failure, or nobody thought of these failures would happen. The final report highlights the need for better smoke detectors and fire extinguishers in cargo holds. It also calls for new fire-resistant cargo containers. The final report for UPS-6 came up with 36 safety recommendations. This number talks by itself on the depth of the safety lessons which we learned from this accident. One of the big changes that's uh, already occurring in the cargo industry is the concept of container level fire detection. Uh, rather than relying on the smoke detection or fire detection in the cargo compartments themselves, these very large compartments, uh, we're moving towards the ability to detect fires inside the cargo pallets themselves, inside the containers rather than waiting before it's too, too late to bid. At UPS, the entire company mourned the loss of their colleagues. Even before the report came out, they took steps to keep their pilots safer. The company is testing a new cargo container that can withstand a 1,200 degree fire for up to four hours. That, you know, that type of containment capability will allow 
our people, as well as anyone in the world, to, to safely get an aircraft on the ground no matter where they're flying. UPS has also improved safety in the cockpit. Uh, we've implemented full face oxygen masks, which can be placed on our pilots with one hand. Uh, three seconds gives them more time to respond to perhaps a smoke-filled cockpit. We also will be the first international carrier uh, to install EVAS, which is the Enhanced Vision Assurance System. The new system creates a sealed air bubble for the pilots that allows them to see both their instruments and the view ahead if the cockpit ever fills with smoke. The industry has taken on board what's in the report. They've ad they're addressing the risk clearly. There's a general public awareness that the batteries now can pose a serious risk. So in all of the safety recommendations which the Civil Aviation Authority have put in the report are implemented, any other similar accident will be avoided. For two years, they're the lords of the skies. We're now take off. Quest time flight number 360. And our lives are in their hands. Pilots. But what happens if a pilot doesn't know what he's doing? Ah. It turned like this and nose dived into the ground. The airplane hits the surface of the sea, everybody dies. Pilot error has been responsible for some of the worst accidents in aircraft history. Unfortunately, uh, he didn't handle this particular situation correctly. The fight to reduce pilot error has become one of the big challenges of aviation. Tens of millions of pounds are being thrown at the problem. Airbus's philosophy was, we can make an airplane that's pilot proof. But in a bid to eliminate pilot error, have we gone too far? Could it be some of these developments may have actually caused disasters? safest airline in the world. Famously, none of its big jets has ever crashed. But in autumn 2008, that reputation is suddenly on the line. Qantas Flight 72 is traveling from Singapore to Perth. It's an Airbus A330, one of the most modern aircraft in the world. At the controls, the flight crew are equipped with the latest technology designed to make flying safer. But as the aircraft, packed with over 300 holidaymakers, nears the Australian coast, it suddenly performs a series of bizarre and dangerous moves. First, it climbs 200 feet. Then, equally suddenly, it drops 650. What's the plane doing? What's the plane doing? The pilots have no idea what's going on. The plane is acting entirely on its own. Then it happens again. Uncommanded by the pilots, the plane plunges another 400 feet. Minutes later, the horrified captain issues a Mayday distress call. Mayday, 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 Montes 72. 315 people's lives are on the line. Will the pilot be able to rescue the situation? Yet the Irish the entire incident is due to a computer controlled hey. flying system designed to eliminate a common cause of air crashes. 
pilot error. Just how serious the problem of pilot error can be is brought home to the people of Britain in the winter of 1989. British Midland Flight 92 takes off on a routine flight to Belfast in Northern Ireland. The aircraft is one of Boeing's new 400 series 737s. In charge is 43-year-old Captain Kevin Hunt, one of British Midland's most experienced pilots. His first officer is 39-year-old David McClellan. It's a normal takeoff. But then, 13 minutes into the flight, just as the aircraft is about to hit cruising altitude, there's a shock. Passengers frantically look around for an explanation. Hunt and McClellan immediately suspect one of the plane's two engines has blown up. The cockpit voice recorder picks up Hunt urgently asking which of the two engines is damaged. Which one? Which one? His first reaction is to turn to the aircraft's instruments. Yeah, rustig. But the instruments that would tell him if an engine is malfunctioning the so-called vibration instrumentation is notoriously unreliable in 737s at the time. Pilots don't trust them. So when smoke appears in the cockpit, McClellan falls back on his general knowledge of the aircraft. This tells him the smoke must be coming through the air conditioning system. And this, in 737s, is powered by the right engine. Cockpit voice recorder now picks up McClellan making a clear decision. Hunt immediately shuts down the right hand engine. The clunking and vibrations cease. Carl returns to the cabin. The passengers relax. But minutes later, there's another, even bigger bang. Once again, the plane is rocked by vibrations. Then everything goes eerily quiet. The second left-hand engine has died. Flight BM-92 signs suggest there won't be many survivors. Ed Trimble led the air crash investigation. Mr. Trimble, Mr. Trimble, BBC, can we talk to you? I'm sorry. I think most investigators would have said the chances of many surviving that would have been uh, low. Clearly the aircraft is flying yeah. at over 100 knots on the approach. And suddenly it's been brought to halt very abruptly indeed. And therefore one would have anticipated the G-forces would have been really significant. Amazingly, only 47 passengers die. 71 survive. Among them is the aircraft's captain, Kevin Hunt. At first... He's hailed as a hero for at least bringing some people down alive. But soon afterwards, questions start to be asked. 
we were getting reports of uh, ground, ground witnesses who had seen and heard this aircraft on the approach. Well, what we were being told was that the left engine was covered in fire. It was like looking into a furnace, someone said. This fire in the left-hand engine would have been the first bang the passengers heard. But that shouldn't have been fatal. The twin-engine plane can fly quite safely on one engine. Clearly, that hadn't happened. So the question was, what's happened to the right engine? The right engine is minutely inspected. Slowly, an awful truth dawns. The full strip inspection of the right engine revealed that there were no problems with uh, the right engine uh, prior to the impact. It's the right one. It's definitely the right one. Shutting down the right one. And yet this right-hand engine is the one the crew had shut down. So why had the pilot turned off his only working engine? The investigation will now reveal a classic case of pilot error. The pilots simply weren't familiar with their aircraft. Hunt and McClelland, not trusting their instruments, had relied on their general knowledge of 737s. <coughs> this told them the smoke must be coming from the right engine, and so they'd shut it down. What they didn't know was that the new 400 series 737 is different from its predecessors. The aircon is powered by both engines. The smoke and smell came from the damaged left engine, not the perfectly good right one. David Leonard is a pilot and aircraft journalist. Both pilots had the vibration information in front of their eyes and it was actually Thank you. On the 300, where the vibration instruments were not reliable, they disregarded the instruments altogether. The investigation has revealed an alarming truth. Neither pilot knew enough about the aircraft they were flying. The crash was caused by pilot error. Hunt, far from being a hero, is sacked. But behind the crash lies a much bigger issue that is increasing the chances of pilot error. A deluge of new aircraft models starts appearing from the 1980s onwards. There was a period of great development, a great change in the industry. Captain Chris Clark is an airline pilot and flight trainer. Pilots were faced with a significant number of differing um, equipment, even on the same type of aircraft. It's a situation almost designed to foster pilot error. Pilots are having increasing difficulty keeping up with the ever-changing models. It could be a different set of flight instruments, or it could be a different flight management system computer. Each new version is better and safer than its predecessor, or fills a particular niche in the competitive aircraft market. But Kegworth has dramatically shown the downside. Hunt and McClelland had had almost no training on the new Boeing 737-400 series. The airline had assumed that because these people were experienced on the 737-300, that they really only needed what they referred to as a differences course to go on to the 400. Kegworth is a clear warning. Pilots need more systematic retraining if there are not to be further cases of pilot error. Pilots now begin to spend more time in highly realistic, computer-controlled flight simulators. But despite the new training opportunities, the airline industry doesn't fully learn the lessons from Kegworth. It's not just about having more training. 
The training has to be good, or there can be unexpected consequences, every bit as deadly. It will need another tragic accident for the industry to realize it must do even more. Autumn 2001, and an American Airlines flight takes off from New York's Kennedy Airport. Flight 587 is bound for the Dominican Republic. On board, many of the passengers are visiting family and friends. But almost immediately after takeoff, something goes wrong. Patrick Tuhig is a local Catholic priest. I spotted this aircraft uh, going over. I thought, uh, to looking back on it, that it was, it was flying a bit low. It turned like this and nosedived into the ground. So then I said to myself, oh my God, this is very, very serious. And I remember thinking how beautiful that plane looked in the last seconds of its life, because the sun shining directly onto that aircraft before it hit the ground. American 587 Abbey, I'm not receiving your transponder. American 587 Abbey, New York. American 587 Abbey, New York. Two hundred and sixty-five people die immediately, including five on the ground. Christine Negroni is a journalist who's written extensively about the aircraft industry. It was a, a dramatic event because it was only two months after 9-11, and so there were immediate concerns and eyewitness accounts and everything else, you know, that the plane had... Uh, had been the victim of a terrorist attack. It's one of the worst accidents in American aviation history. If you saw the people in the immediate vicinity, they were stunned. One of the victims is Jose Laura, a law student. His sister still finds it hard to talk about it. It's really hard to live with this pain. I don't, I don't want to, I don't even want to see my brother picture because I don't want, I don't want to think that he's, he's not here, who he else no more. The man in charge of the crash investigation is Bob Benson. He immediately faces demands for instant answers. This is a very public disaster in a very public place. There was a lot of pressure from the city of New York. Uh, the very first news conference we give, we always get the question, uh, what happened here? Uh, what's the cause of this accident? And of course, we can never answer. The hunt for answers is hampered by the sheer scale of the devastation. There is almost nothing left of the aircraft. My initial thoughts are really about, about the magnitude of our job. A lot of times in these types of accidents, we get a lot of information out of the wreckage itself. But in this case, unfortunately, the fire was so complete, uh, the aircraft was full of fuel when it hit the ground, that we had very few physical clues to look at. But then they find one massive clue. It had to do with the vertical stabilizer of the airplane that uh, was floating. In